It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote uh, speaker, our bench to bedside speaker, um, Dr. Phil Skolnick. He's actually the director of the Division of Pharmacotherapies and Medical Consequences of Drug Abuse at NIH. Um, Phil was appointed a couple of years ago and uh, could have been for many reasons. It could have been his more than 20 awards, his over 500 publications, his H index of 53, uh, more than 10,000 citations. There are many reasons, but part of what Phil has managed to do and one of the reasons he was appointed is bringing his um, private sector experience in drug development and his experience in academia as well as his work and previously with the NIH in order to bring all of these aspects together to lead the fight towards treating drug abuse. Um, we're all here to see his talk and I don't want to take up any more of his time, so please help me welcome Dr. Phil Skolnick. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. It's, uh, I'm delighted to be here and I thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, so, as Jared mentioned, I came to NIH a couple of, or returned to NIH a couple of years ago after spending about 13 years in industry. Um, and I was charged with uh, leading a division that, that develops medications to treat uh, substance use disorders, which is the politically correct, correct term now for uh, addictions or dependence. Um, and so I started thinking about the progress that we've made in, in treating uh, substance use disorders over the years. And here I'm, I'm being a little bit politically correct. I said the gains are incremental. And uh, a couple of things happened right after I got to, to NIDA to convince me of that. This is a press release, for those of you in the back that can't see, from October 2010. And it's an announcement from the FDA that they approved uh, Vivitrol to treat uh, or to prevent relapse uh, to opiate dependence. And so those of you who know what Vivitrol is, it's naltrexone. Uh, naltrexone is a drug that's been around for a very, very long time. And so this is basically a reformulation of naltrexone. So that uh, you would call a very, very small step forward. I think it's a useful medication. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that this is not a giant leap forward. It's a it's sort of an umbrella step. Um, the other thing which happened about the same time was that a small company called Titan Pharmaceuticals announced a positive phase three trial for probufine. Now, probufine are buprenorphine implants. Buprenorphine is a, an opiate substitution therapy that's been around for much more than a decade. And so what they did was they put a formulation together where you put it, you implant it right under the muscle in the bicep, and you, it gives you basically protection for about six months. But it is an umbrella step forward, very, very modest, uh, uh, in, incremental step forward. Um, what happened, I, I, I highlight this because the FDA Advisory Committee recommended approval about, by a vote of 10 to 4 in May. And unfortunately, last month, the FDA rejected the Provifine NDA. They said the uh, risk-benefit ratio was not clear to them. So it's, it's, really, uh, it's, it's really an area uh, that has fallen behind other areas of psychiatry uh, in terms of drug development. And it's not for lacking targets. If you look at preclinical studies and the, the uh, addiction models, I think, uh, you know, coming from an area, from other areas of psychiatry, the um, addiction models have pretty good, pretty good face validity, pretty good construct validity. Um, and multi these are not all the targets that have been identified, but there, there are really a host of them. Um, and what's interesting is based on preclinical models that compounds acting at these targets may be effective against multiple drugs of abuse. So if you have a compound, for example, that's a D4 antagonist, and it will block um, relapse to nicotine, relapse to cocaine, that's a pretty, pretty powerful combination. So that's not the reason why um, we're falling behind. So when I came to NIH, I spent the first few months there trying to think about, about why we haven't been more successful. And the very clear reason, I mean, I think the root cause is that big pharma has never embraced de developing medications to treat addictions, where they have in other areas of psychiatry. 
And I have an asterisk here because it says with the exception of nicotine. And even for nicotine, if you think about the public health consequences of smoking and the amount of money that pharma has invested in developing treatments for, for, for the smoking cessation, it's actually quite modest. So why, the, the, you always ask yourself why. So why, why hasn't pharma embraced uh, uh, substance use disorders? So the first thing that you hear, um, and I don't, I, you know, I, I actually love to tell stories, but I don't really have time today to tell stories about, um, about this particular topic. But the, the, the cost, the, the reason, the, I mean, the root cause is, that's cited by pharma is the cost of developing a new chemical entity. So you have a molecule in the laboratory, and you take it to the clinic and you get it approved, and it can cost about a bit, bit south of $2 billion to develop a drug. It's an awful lot of money. And so implicit in that is that the perception is that there would be a low return on investment in the drugs to treat addictions, as opposed to anti-cancer drugs, as opposed to antipsychotics. And so let me spend a minute, because um, I know that a lot of you don't think about these types of issues, but coming from pharma, you think about this a lot, about how can you best um, protect the, the, the company, the stockholder, and now that I work for the government, to protect the taxpayer in terms of, of spends. So I will tell you that this, this, by the way, is an article that appeared in Science about three years ago by one of my former colleagues, Steve Paul. Um, and you can see that among these different, this is an average, um, but among these different uh, disease areas, that CNS drug development is by far the most expensive. Okay? It's uh, 849 million. The average for these and others is about 750 million. So it's significantly higher. Now, those of you that were listening to what I said before about the cost being about a bit south of $2 billion, say, well, wait a minute. This is a lot south of $2 billion, right? It is. But I want you to think about this. How long does it take to develop a drug? Well, currently, it probably takes more than 15 years, 15, 16 years. And if I took that cost of capital, if I took that $850 million and invested it in something other than a, 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 a low-interest checking account, but it, which is what companies do, they invest their money. You could more than double your money in 15 years. So the question is, why would you invest in an area that has a low return on investment? And that, that's something which you need to think about. The economics are interesting. Now, this is something that appeared, an article that appeared last year that said that that previous article in Science is not true, is not correct, that they grossly underestimated the cost of developing a drug, and it's somewhere between $4 billion and $11 billion. And if you, I would encourage you to look at this article. It's by a guy called Matthew Herper. Now, his methods may be flawed, but so could the science articles be flawed. So I think the take-home message is that it's an awful lot of money and an awful lot of risk in developing drugs. And um, the perception is that there's a low return in investment in addictions because there's a very small market size. And I'm here to tell you today that that's just not true. And, it, and this is, I don't go by belief, I only go by data. This is uh, the sales over the past couple of years for a, a compo compound called Suboxone in the U.S. Anybody know what Suboxone is? Yell it out. Buprenorphine, Thank you. It's buprenorphine, it's a reformulation of buprenorphine and naloxone. Put it under the tongue as a tablet or a film. And it has a lower abuse potential because you've got the, the buprenorphine combined with naloxone. So if you dissolve it and you inject it, you get a little hit of naloxone too, takes away that immediate high. But the sales in 2012 were bigger than Viagra in the U.S. That's an eye-opener. And as opposed to every time you turn on the TV, you have a, the, the cowboy in Viagra, you don't see that in the U.S. You don't see that for Suboxone. It's not advertised at all. And that's not a first-in-class product. You're competing against methadone, you're competing against deponaltrexone, and you can still make a billion and a half dollars in sales in the U.S. So the idea that you can't make money in addictions or there's no market in addictions is just not true. So if we go through the, 
think about other types of drugs of abuse. Remember, there are no drugs approved for cocaine, and no drugs approved for, for methamphetamine dependence, no, no drugs approved for cannabis dependence. And we look at how much money a first-in-class compound could make if you had an effective treatment for, or a first-in-class treatment, first compound approved, to treat cocaine abuse. So in the past month, this is a survey from the National uh, Survey on uh, Drug Health and Use, and this is, by the way, how marketeers make their numbers. No, I'm just doing the same thing. Uh, use of cocaine during the past month, that's 1.4 million in the U.S. If you look at use during the past year, it's probably about 5 or 6 million. But I'm not really interested. I mean, people that, that, that snort a line of cocaine once or twice a year are not really the market that you're looking for. You're looking for the market as a woman whose lips are burned from a crack pipe. That's who you want to treat. And so we use this, this uh, number, 1.4 million, as a good starting point. Now, if you have 1.4 users and you think 15% will seek treatment each year, and the United States, and a lot of this is very U.S.-centric, and I apologize to the international audience, um, but if 15 seek treatment each year, then the market is 210,000 a year. If you, the average treatment duration is six months, and remember, a, a, a drug dependence is sort of a relapsing disorder, uh, and you charge $800 a month, and that number is based on what, what you charge for depot naltrexone, the market is well over a billion dollars a year. So I think that, that you, can, you can really make a very compelling argument that if you had a first-in-class compound, this may be an underestimate. If you had a really effective treatment for uh, cocaine dependence, you might, in fact, get more people coming out for treatment. So there is a market for it. Uh, so the perception of small market size is just a perception. I think it's not a reality. And the other thing that, that you hear from from people in the field is that, you know, conducting a clinical trial in, for example, methamphetamine dependence, cocaine dependence is difficult. And it's difficult because there are a lot of comorbid conditions. A lot of these people are intravenous drug users. They've got, for example, a high incidence of HIV, a high incidence of hep C. They may be taking six or seven other medications. And so there, there are these um, concomitant medication issues about drug metabolism. So that's sort of a pain in the ass. There are also lifestyle issues. You have people in a trial, and all of a sudden they don't show up, and they're tangled up with the criminal justice system. And so you lose subjects that way. But I will tell you that every trial that I've been involved with, I think the, the best analogy is every trial is a cross, and it's got a different set of nails. So substance use disorders are difficult and challenging, but as I said, each therapeutic indication has its own set of challenges. And there's something which, which is really, particularly for psychiatric disorders, an issue that we have not been dealing with adequately, and I want to talk about it today because it affects me directly in, in the area of, of drug abuse. And I want to start discussing this using, uh, using an anecdote. This is a paper that appeared in 2009 in the American Journal of Psychiatry, and I tried to make it as big as I could for the people in the back. It's a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial to vigabatrin, that's gamma vinyl GABA, in cocaine dependence. Now, this study was done by a drug company, a small, very small drug company, uh, with about 50 subjects in an arm, double-blind, placebo-controlled. And they found that vigabatrin, which is used for the treatment of epilepsy, was actually very effective at producing end-of-trial abstinence. It was actually surprisingly effective. And so based on that small trial, the company uh, invested an awful lot of money and did a multi-site trial with 180 subjects in arm, uh, and they failed to show efficacy. And so when they started thinking about the, um, the way they did the trial, what were the differences in the, between the successful trial and the unsuccessful trial? The, in Mexico, in this uh, Paroli study, they used uh, three grams once a day and they, they was observed dosing twice a week. So uh, let me say it now, is that one of the nice things about doing work in, in uh, substance use disorders is that we have a biomarker for efficacy, which is unique among psychiatric disorders. And what is it? Well, you have your subjects come in two or three times a week. They pee in a cup. And if, they're, if there's no drug in the urine, then you know that your drug is working or your therapy is working. 
So it, it sort of beats doing a trial in, in schizophrenia, I promise. Um, in any event, they would come in for, to give the urine specimen, and they would get their observed dosing twice a week. In the U.S., it was a, 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 a completely outpatient trial with no observed dosing, and they divided up the dose uh, into two because that's a, a lot of drug to give at one time. And so those were the only differences that they could see other than one was done in Mexican parolees and one was done in, in the U.S. So the results of the trial, uh, so I showed you the top-line results. There was no difference. Uh, this paper was published actually in April this year in JAMA Psychiatry. And there was no significant difference, as I told you before. But when they looked at the urine levels of vigabatrin, they found that 40 to 60% of the patients we're not taking the medication, okay? So here's actually the data that they were actually shared with us, and which is now published in that paper. So if we know, got, Vigabitrin is a drug that's been used for years. We know what the pharmacokinetics are, it's well-behaved, and we know what the, what the urine levels should be at steady state. And so if, 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 if the number 630 micrograms per mil means anything, it means that about 40% of the subjects uh, were taking the drug on a regular basis, and about 50% of the drug, 50% uh, of the subjects were not. In fact, were non-compliant. Okay. So it gets back to the issue of was this a failed uh, was this a failed study? That is, did the drug not work? Did not work separate from placebo? Was it a failed trial? Was there some flawed defect in the trial? that really invalidates it. And you really can't tell if the subjects aren't taking the meds. So what I'm going to tell you now is that this was not a black swan event. And uh, in the area of substance use disorders, we've seen this multiple times. And I'm going to show you one more example, not to belabor the point about substance use disorders. A paper published in 2012, it was actually done in my division. Uh, the study was... Um, almost finished when, by the time I got there. It was done by, by uh, many of my colleagues in our, uh, in our clinical trials branch. Uh, and they used the drug modafinil to treat methamphetamine dependence. And in this paper, well, you can imagine it appeared in drug and alcohol dependence. If it had worked, it probably would have appeared in New England Journal. Um, anyway, there were no differences among groups in any relevant uh, outcome measure. So the question is, is it a failed study? Did the drug not work, or is it a failed trial? Was there some flaw in the design of the trial? And when I had, when I had got there, uh, I asked them about uh, what was their compliance measure. And they said, oh, we're using pill counts and self-reports. Um, and the trial was still going on, and of course we saved the urines to measure methamphetamine. And I asked them if they wouldn't measure uh, modafinil in the urine. And this is the results. It's actually published in that Anderson paper. Uh, if you look at self-reporting compliance on the ordinate and the amount of uh, compliance based on how much any modafinil found in the urine, this is the line of truth. Okay? The reality is very far from the truth. We had fully 10% of the subjects, and uh, you can't really, this really doesn't do it justice because sometimes you have you know, 14 dots on the same line, so it's one dot. But over 10% of the subjects never took a dose of medication during the trial. How many of these people said, oh, yeah, you know, I'm taking it 80 90% of the time and took it 10% of the time? And that's just a snapshot of their compliance because they were only coming in uh, twice a week for urine samples. So, um, again, I can't determine if it's a failed study or failed trial, but I can tell you that the hypothesis that modafinils uh, may be effective in the treatment of methamphetamine dependence was not tested adequately. So now I'm going to tell you that this is an issue that, that it, it is not unique to substance use disorders, that is found in many areas of psychiatry, neuropsychiatry. This is a trial that I was involved in, uh, it's a phase three study, which means it's a very large and very expensive study involving hundreds of patients of an analgesic to treat chronic low back pain, which is a really devastating illness. And um, one of the arms in this phase, this is a registration quality study. One of the arms had what we call a PKPD component. So we wanted to make, we had done phase two studies where you measure blood levels and you see how the, 
the response goes, and this is a very effective analgesic. And uh, we had uh, multiple arms. We had 114 subjects in this arm that were getting drug. And when we looked at, at the last visit, uh, the primary endpoint measure was the change in the visual analog scale from the uh, randomization point to the last point. So that last week, they took the last dose of drug that came in the next day, and we took their blood sample, and we said, please rate how your chronic, chronic low back pain is doing. So there are a couple, of, a couple of very salient points in this slide. The first point is uh, that the N is very large. It's 132 in the placebo group. And that there's no difference in the visual analog scale between the people that didn't take the drug and those that uh, were on placebo. Okay? Now, if you put this data together, which is what you do when you do an IT, uh, intent to treat analysis, you don't think about compliance, that there's no difference between the drug treated and the placebo. Okay? Which you, you, that is not expressed here. But if you took the drug, if you were compliant, and this is a snapshot of compliance, if there was any measurable drug in the, urine, in the blood at that last visit, you had a significant effect of the, of the analgesic. Okay? Any, any measure. So it goes from 3 nanograms per mil to 500. Now, based on our phase 2 studies, we knew that an effective analgesic dose was 500, gave you a plasma level of 500 nanograms per mil. If you were compliant, and only a very small percentage of this uh, group, which was 114, you only had about 20, 25% that were, we think were compliant, you had a very nice effect, and in fact you had almost sort of a dose response ordering. It's incredible. So uh, this actually, uh, we had to kill the program because we didn't know this till much later, and uh, it was not acceptable to management to go forward. So this is, I, I, this is actually a story that I, I will tell you. I got this, an email from one of, my, one of my comrades last week, and for those of you in the back that can't read it, I'm just going to read the area in red. This is a fellow who's involved in clinical trials. The University of Pennsylvania had a clinical trials outpatient center and at some point, the hedges out front were removed as part of the landscaping renovation. What do you think the workmen discovered? Dozens of bottles of investigational drugs that the study participants over the years were supposed to be taking recording in their diaries. So what that does is it speaks to the way that we recruit uh, subjects in our clinical trials. And also that this issue of compliance is probably something which needs to be addressed if we're going to adequately test hypotheses in the clinic. Let me follow on, though, and tell you it sounds uh, and, and tell you that this is not an issue that's confined to the conduct of clinical trials. That average people taking medications uh, don't actually take the medications very well. This is an article that appeared in New England Journal about three years ago, and it was done by two medical economists. And what they showed, based on surveys, is among patients who have health plans with no cost sharing for medications. And Jared and I were just talking about that. The rates of non-adherence were nearly 40%. So this is uh, disease agnostic. It's antihypertensives, anti-diabetics, anti-cholesterol meds. It's incredible. Fully reimbursed, the medicine is free, and you still don't take the medication. Um, and so this is a medical economics. Something appeared, actually, I, I got it two weeks ago, and I wanted to put it in here. This is an independent confirmation of that number. This is done by Quest Diagnostics, which is a very large diagnostic uh, firm in the US. And for those of you that can't read, um, basically the, the uh, urines were sent to the laboratory by the physicians to see whether or not they were taking their drugs. 25% uh, of the patients were negative for any drug, including the prescribed drug. Another 15% were negative for the prescribed drug and positive for another drug. So this number of 40% comes up independently three years later using a different metric, a different technique. It's really pretty remarkable because it's estimated that this non-adherence, and I'm using the words interchangeably, costs the U.S. health care system $100 billion a year. Go figure. Okay. So it's an issue, as I said before, in both the conduct of clinical trials and in clinical practice. But for me, and I'm talking from a very focused standpoint, I'm trying to make you know, make this work. 
is we're focused on the issue of hypothesis testing. Is medication X effective in condition Y? Is modafinil effective in the treatment of methamphetamine dependence? And you can't adequately test that hypothesis unless we can ensure patients are medication compliant. It sounds like uh, data 101. But I bring it up to this audience, particularly in salient, I think, because there are a lot of basic neuroscientists in this, this area. And you go through drug development, and you have models, and models have been criticized all the time, and drugs work in the model. You take them to the clinic, it doesn't work. And people said, the model is no good, the target's no good, da 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 And sometimes it's as simple as you've got to get the patients to take the med. And that is not taken into account. It's sort of like the crazy uncle that people don't talk about. So how do we tackle the problem? One way is by electronic monitoring. There's something called a MEMS cap, um, which is basically a pill bottle. And when you, detect, when you unscrew the lid, uh, there's, it registers. And you can tell what time the patient took the, took the, the dose of drug. Uh, I can tell you that this is easily gained. You can just take the cap off. And you take the pill and throw it in the toilet, finished. So I, I don't have a lot, of, a lot of trust in that system. What we do now in every trial that we run at NIDA and every major grant that we fund, we will not fund that, I won't sign that check until I'm sure that there's a drug, that we can measure drug or metabolite in a biological fluid into every clinical trial protocol and that we use in an invaluable population of those patients that took the drug. Okay. That's now for us that standard operating procedure. Now, the, the, the difficulty with that is you don't know what's happening in the placebo group, right? You can have good behaviors, bad behaviors, and how do you figure that out? Well, what you do is what we're doing in the midterm is we're actually developing biomarkers at NIDA that we can incorporate into formulations and actually measure the uh, adherence in both the placebo group and the uh, drug group, and you can stratify based on compliance. We're doing that right now. We have stuff in the clinic. We're also using, actually, in the trial that we're starting next year, we're going to include what I call a homeopathic dose of the drug. So we're actually, the, the active dose of the drug is about 60 milligrams a day. We're incorporating 6 milligrams a day. So it's a tenth of the active dose. So it's not really homeopathic, but it's certainly detectable in the urine. Uh, and in the informed consent, we don't say this is, you may receive placebo, you may receive one or two doses of drug. That's it. And we'll be able to tell whether or not people are taking drug in the control group. The, the technology that I'm most excited about is the smart pill. And if you, those of you who haven't heard about a smart pill, uh, it's a little electronic chip that costs, I don't know, 50 cents or so. Uh, and it's incorporated, actually, it's quite, it's a microchip. Um, you put it in a capsule, it dissolves in the stomach acid, and you have the, the subject wear a transmitter. And as soon as it hits the stomach acid, it emits a radio signal. It's captured in the transmitter. They come in once a week, download the data, and you'll know exactly when they took a pill. And that way, whether it's, and it's agnostic, it's drug, placebo, it doesn't matter, we'll be able to know uh, we'll be able to stratify based on compliance in a very precise way. And that's coming, actually. And the most important thing, though, is the rec recognition by the regulatory authorities that stratification based on compliance is really the only way to, uh, to do hypothesis testing. And that, for now, a snapshot of compliance uh, may be the only practical surrogate. And this is an uphill battle for me and the regulatory people. But um, otherwise, I think we'll never able to successfully develop actually small molecules. And the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about something completely different. But anyway, it, it's an interesting area. And so uh, you'll never hear this in school, kids. This is something which you know, you'll hear only at an IBNS bed to bedside lecture. Okay. The, the other issue about you know, what, what's really inhibited or, or, or contributed to the lack of development of drugs to treat addictions is the stigma that's uh, associated with, ad with uh, addiction to illegal substances. So there's some companies that are just not interested in having their name associated with methamphetamine abuse, with heroin abuse. On the other hand, if you have the opportunity, particularly in these days, of a market of one or two billion dollars a year, I suspect that a lot of people uh, may come around 
to a different way of thinking. And that, that's just a matter of time, I think. And f the last issue, I think, which is a very significant one, is a perception of a high regulatory hurdle. These are our comrades at the FDA. So this is a, actually a slide that, that my associate director, Dave McCann, gave to me. Uh, what does the FDA want today? What do they expect of a drug? So what they want is they want a success-failure analysis, no group means. So what does that mean? This is a typical slide that you see in the literature. If Dr. Lindstrom is in the audience, I'll talk to you later, and I apologize for, for uh, bringing data. But, but a lot of substance use data is expressed this way. Percent of negative urine samples, and this was a 12-week study, and they came in twice a week. And you can see that the drug treatment here uh, gave a significantly higher percentage of uh, of uh, amphetamine-free urines over time. That's not what the FDA wants to see. They want to see individual, uh, individual data, success-failure analysis. Was this patient abstinent? Was this patient not abstinent? Uh, the success must be clinically significant, and that's like Bill Clinton saying, it depends on what the definition of is is. Um, the... And, and actually, this is from the FDA. It's very hard to get them to say stuff in writing, but in fact, they've said this. Preferably, success will be defined by a period of abstinence that lasts through the end of treatment with a grace period allowed for onset of action. So I think you know that um, if you've been taking drugs of abuse for many, many years, there may be some changes in brain chemistry, and the FDA is saying, yeah, the drug should take a couple of weeks to work, but once it works, we should be back on course. And in fact, there are examples in the literature of drugs working this way. This is this Vigabatrin study that was done in Mexico. And I'm not saying that Vigabatrin is useful in, 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 in cocaine dependence. What I'm saying is that this is a, an example of a trial, that the kind of data that the FDA wants to see. So this is percent of study participants in treatment and abstinent through the end of the nine-week trial. And you can see, starting at about three weeks, you see a significant separation between the placebo and the Vigabatrin groups. And that's the kind of data that they're looking, looking for. So thinking about you know, not being an, an expert in substance use disorders, but having done other things in my life, um, to me, it's abstinence, abstinence from a drug is analogous to remission in other psychiatric disorders. I think that analogy is not an unfair one. And Drugs have been approved for, for example, depression. If there is a significant improvement in an outcome measure, absent complete symptom remission. I mean, if you think about it, uh, if you have a response, significant response in, with an antidepressant, 50% reduction in the HAMD score, and you get a significant improvement over placebo, you will get that drug approved. Not the case in substance use disorders. This craving, is a, they said that's a symptom. We're not interested in that. You know? um, so the question is, for me, is it even a realistic expectation that a medication can produce, with or without psychotherapy, produce sustained abstinence uh, in this disease? And the, I don't know the answer. So the... the even though I, I'm not disagreeing that it is an ideal outcome to treat substance use disorders, you would like your patients to be abstinent, not to be taking heroin anymore, no, not to be smoking anymore, right? You want that. Um, and so the current regulatory view is no amount of an illegal drug is the only acceptable outcome at the moment. That is a stand which they are un, unmoved on. And what they say is in alcohol abuse, uh, that's not true. Abstinence is not the end point. They will allow a reduction in the number of no heavy drinking days. Um, and that's because alcohol in small amounts is associated with salutary outcomes for the patient. And so the, what I've been told by the FDA is if you can show me that a 30%, for, I'm using 30% as an example, that a 30% or 50% reduction in cocaine use has a quantifiable salutary benefit We'll accept it. And the challenge for us has been to be able to show that with a medical, and it seems to me damn obvious that if you're taking half the amount of cocaine that you took before, that you might be 
less involved with the criminal justice system, less involved to do harm to yourself and others. That's not acceptable. They want to see data. And so we're trying to generate that data now, but it gets back to the issue of how do you even measure whether or not uh, somebody, ha how do you accurately measure that reduction in cocaine use? And that's a separate issue, which we even really haven't started to address appropriately. So I'm going to actually come to the last half of my talk, because I've talked a lot about medicine, economics, and I want to finish it with an area because I've been very negative about the substance use disorder field, about small molecules. Um, I want to tell you about an avenue which is, it's not unique to substance use disorders, but it's an interesting approach and uh, uh, because I'm a small molecule pharmacologist, I, I've actually thought this is a pretty nifty way to do things. So this is a biological approach to treat substance use disorders. So it's something that until I got tonight I really hadn't thought about. But you can raise vaccines. You can, you can develop vaccines. Uh, so the body uh, develops antibodies against specific antigens uh, like cocaine, nicotine, and heroin. And I'm putting an asterisk because remember, these are small molecules. And to develop a, a vaccine to cocaine, you need a little help. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Monoclonal antibodies are passive immunization techniques. So you're actually injecting the antibody already. Uh, to, for example, methamphetamine. And there's such a compound in clinical trials right now. Uh, there's another technique, uh, which is a bioengineered, genetically engineered enzyme that rapidly degrades cocaine. And that's also in the clinic, and I'm going to tell you about that. And just to remind you, these are very large molecules. They're proteins. And so you're talking about molecules of greater than 100 kilodalton in size. So just by dint of that size, they don't get into the central nervous system, right? All the actions are peripheral. Now, what I really like about these biologics, which you probably figured out by now, is they allow a patient to make one good decision to take a treatment, not daily decisions about, Jesus, am I going to take this vigabitrin or not? You, they'll come in once a week for an injection of this engineered enzyme, or they'll come in for a series of vaccinations. And once they're vaccinated, and they've got a high titer of antibody, they're protected. So it's a, it's a much different concept, and it's an important one. And for me, that's why it's attractive and worthy of investing, uh, investing investment. So as again, in contrast to a pharmacodynamic small molecule strategy, like Vivitrol, which is one that I mentioned before, these biological approaches rely on pharmacokinetics. So basically, by either sequestering or degrading the abused molecule, they keep the drug out of the target organ, out of the brain. That's it. And the lower brain concentrations will be less reinforcing per unit dose if there's less around, okay. for example, per cigarette. Now, you know, that's an interesting thing. There's some, there's, it's not perfect. So biological strategies are very specific. So a vaccine directed against heroin would not cross-react with methadone. So you can be on a methadone maintenance program, but if you have a heroin vaccine, you won't take heroin. Now that would not, uh, I mean, it's good because, for example, if, you have a, if you're on Vivitrol, for example, and you get in a car accident, you need an anesthesiologist to treat you to overcome the Vivitrol that's on board. Here, if you're in a car accident and you have a heroin on board and they give you uh, Demerol, you're good to go. On the other hand, it doesn't preclude you from snorting Oxycontin, right? So uh, it's, it's not perfect because this, this, this specificity is both a plus and a minus. The other issue and the other challenge that I alluded to before is that nicotine, heroin, cocaine are small molecules, and they're not inherently antigenic. The body doesn't recognize them as foreign bodies. So you have to do a little tricking you have to fool the body to make an antibody specific to nicotine. And the way that's done is by making this is a derivative in this particular, it's th uh, th three amino methyl nicotine. And it's reacted with uh, succinaldehyde, which is, a, a, and a very large, very antigenic protein. In this case, they use a recombinant protein from Pseudomonas, which is a, a lung bacterium. It's an exoprotein, which is not harmful but it is very highly antigenic. And people that are injected with this develop antibodies to this very readily. So you link these things chemically, 
and you inject them with something called an adjuvant. An adjuvant boosts the immune system. In this case, it was alum. Uh, and you expect to find antibodies to nicotine. Here's some animal data that shows you that, in fact, it works in animals very nicely. So what we're doing is we're injecting uh, IV nicotine, uh, tenth of a milligram per kilogram IV, it's six or seven cigarettes. And you can see in the vaccinated animals, the serum levels of nicotine are very high compared to the control conditions, whilst the brain concentrations of nicotine are very low compared to the control levels. So it's keeping the drug of abuse out of the target organ. One of the predictions would be for this type of molecule is that the, uh, because it's kept in the plasma, or in the serum in this case, the, the half time of the drug is very long. So nicotine normally is around, with a T1 half, about an hour and a half. In a vaccinated animal, it's 4.9 days, basically never leaves. It's just kind of slowly, it, it um, equilibrates off and it's slowly metabolized out. Now, what about people? Does it work in people? The answer is yes, with an asterisk. So this trial was published two years ago. The company, uh, which no longer is in existence, is called Nobby, and the vaccine is called NICVAX, nicotine vaccine. So what they did was they showed, and this is a top-line result, continuous abstinence. That's the FDA requirement for nicotine because there's no amount of cigarette smoking that has a salutary effect. So abstinence, just like for an illegal drug. But you can get six-month abstinence, a rate of 25%, as opposed to 13%. Now, this is a phase two study, so what they did was they parsed out the data based on the antibody responses. So about, this is the highest third, this is the highest tertile of subjects with the highest antibody levels. You had an effect of 25% abstinence compared to 13% at six months, 18% versus 6% at a year. So it's a very effective treatment. If you had uh, low antibody titers, below a certain arbitrary level that they, they estimated, uh, it was no different than placebo. Okay? So they went into a phase three trial, and guess what? Oops, I'm sorry. Oh, one other thing I wanted to say was that one of the things that I was concerned about, about when I heard this uh, business was that uh, people might oversmoke. So if you imagine, once you've got a lot of... Uh, this antibody on board, and you light up and you take a puff, you're not getting that reinforcing effect of nicotine. So you say, well, wait a minute. I'm going to have two puffs. I'm going to have another cigarette, another. And that was my main concern. But in fact, uh, with, this, with this particular vaccine, you cannot oversmoke, so, or you do not oversmoke. So here you see the top, uh, top tertile of antibody, uh, of, of people with antibody levels. And in fact, the uh, median number of cigarettes is diminished. And it's, there's not, not a, there was not an initial trend to oversmoke. Here's a placebo and a low antibody. So that, in fact, does not happen in people with this vaccine. So that, that was actually very nice. Despite that, there were two phase three failures with nicotine, with NICVAX. And the company is no longer, the vaccine's dead. Why do you think that is? Well, I'm, they haven't released all the data, but I'm guessing. When they did the phase two studies, they were able to parse the data out based on the antibody levels. And I told you one of the challenges is raising good antibodies with these drugs. And when you do a phase three study, which is a registration trial study, you do what they call ITT. It's all comers, intent to treat analysis. And they try to overcome it. So they figured, well, maybe a third of the subjects are going to have high antibody titers. And they used 1,000 patients in this trial. It's a really expensive trial. And they still were not able to overcome the uh, idea that this particular antibody uh, this particular vaccine was not particularly good at raising antibodies specific for nicotine. So that's why this failed. So is the nicotine vaccine business done? The answer is no. So this is a paper that appeared in uh, this year, and it came from Pfizer vaccine research. And so basically what they did, the same thing, a three amino methyl nicotine conjugate with a different protein, but what they're using is a different adjuvant. So the adjuvant that was used in the uh, trial um, in the NAVI trial was alum, aluminum hydroxide. I call it the Louis Pasteur Special. It is a early 20th century uh, invention. Uh, this new adjuvant that they're using, which is an ol oligonucleotide, uh, gives you uh, antibody titers that are probably fivefold higher in humans than alum alone. 
Uh, so here the title is Enhancing the Effect of Nicotine Vaccine Using a 21st Century Adjuvant. For those of you in the back that can't see, these are uh, antibody titers on a log scale. And so if you use alum alone with the nicotine antibody, you get a certain level. Uh, you get about a log, 1.5 log unit difference after the first dose, about a log unit after the second dose, a little less than a log unit after the third dose. So if, you can, if that actually obtains in humans, and it does obtain with other vaccines, they may be able to raise vaccine titers high enough that they'll have an effective vaccine. And so um, they haven't, this is all preclinical, but I, this is certainly um, can be used clinically. And whether or not it does, we'll see. The last bit of science I wanted to finish with is a, an engineered esterase. And the reason I'm, do, I'm talking about it also because it's actually it's been translated. It's not completely reduced to practice, but it's been translated. So normally, cocaine is hydrolyzed by butyrol cholinesterase, which we all have in our blood, brains. We have it all over. And it's done at a certain rate. Now, Steve Rimajoin and his colleagues many years ago, not many years ago, so 10 years ago, showed that they could increase the catalytic activity by successive point mutations in this molecule. So if you make, this one is four point mutations, uh, you can increase the catalytic activity over a thousandfold. Okay. And if you inject animals, now it's called with this enzyme, which is now called TV1380, TV means Teva, who is actually sponsoring along with NIDA these trials. Um, you can see that, in fact, the, uh, it works as, as advertised. So if you look af 10 minutes after an IV injection of cocaine, you will see that the brain levels of cocaine are much reduced, right? The plasma and heart levels of cocaine are much reduced compared to the placebo uh, control situation. And the levels of benzoic acid, which is the hydrolysis product of cocaine, are remarkably increased in plasma. So this enzyme is really quite remarkable. Okay. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time because paid by NIDA, to tell you how these work in our different models. So here we have a relapse model, which is basically a reinstatement paradigm, where I'm sure you know that you can get animals to self-administer cocaine. They will acquire that behavior and maintain it. Uh, if you substitute now the syringe for saline, they will actually, oh, this is, time is not correct, but they will actually spend a little time over uh, pressing the lever to try to get more cocaine. Eventually, the behavior is extinguished, where they, they have very low response rates. You stop the cocaine, you get the extinction. When you give the cocaine a second time, a very small dose, you can reinstate the behavior. D is for drug, S is for saline, and this is what this does. Now, if we look at what happens to TV with TV1380 on board, and I will direct your attention to the active lever. So... You get very little reinstatement. When you give say, uh, cocaine, you get a lot of reinstatement. You can reinstate that behavior. If the animals are pretreated with the enzyme, this engineered butyl cholinesterase, it's almost down to the level of, um, of, of saline. So it blocks cocaine reinstatement. It's pretty cool. Now, in primates, you know, everybody understands the primate self administration model. It's a pretty interesting model. You can get monkeys to uh, self administer cocaine for a very long period of time at fairly stable levels. They're not interested in self-administering saline, but if you give them cocaine again, uh, they will self-administer at a very, very steady level. Right? Now, if we inject these monkeys with TB1380 and then follow that up with cocaine, you can see that the level of self-administration is quite low. Okay. This is a test session every day, so it lasts for at least five, about four to five days. Okay? So the stuff is sustained, and it works in primates. What about people? Well, we've actually already reduced that. We've already put it in the clinic. So if you have, and these are non-treatment-seeking volunteers, by the way. You give them an IV dose of 40 milligrams of cocaine, and this is on the log scale, so you get about 250 nanograms per per mil of cocaine. You inject the uh, 
different doses of this enzyme, including one that we're using in our clinical trial, and you actually remarkably degrade the amount of cocaine. So those of you that you see in the front, those of you who can't, you get about 250 nanograms per mil in a control situation. With this dose of, of PD1380, you reduce it to 30. So you reduce the amount of cocaine by 80%. And the 40 milligrams per kilogram is a pretty good hit. Uh, 40 milligrams, I'm sorry. I this is wrong. This is 40 milligrams IV, not 40 milligrams per kilogram. I have a stiff on the front vehicle. But what I want to say here is that the effect persists for at least a week. Uh, the TB1380 is, is, is an enzyme itself, and it's degraded. But it's, it appears to be safe, and it appears to do what we think it's going to do in the clinic. And so um, that's, oh, and I need to tell you that in order for me to say these things, uh, Teva said that these are my opinions only, and they're not interested in what I say. But um, that's what, but I thought you'd, so it's actually a very exciting time for us, despite all the challenges we have. And let me finish with some, I know we'll leave 10 minutes for questions, you want to stay longer, but let me finish about some, some very sort of fundamental philosophical issues about what we can do, what a general lack of interest in developing uh, and the first thing that I would say, the simplest solution is to incentivize pharma and biotechs to invest in substance use disorders. How do you do that? It's very easy. Promulgating the view that SUDs are not rare, but neglected diseases. So this is a, a play on the FDA, the rare and neglected diseases, and Dr. Collins with his the rare and neglected diseases. So surely substance use dis disorders are not rare, but we can document that they've been neglected. And so you offer economic incentives like market exclusivity, patent extensions for investment in R&D specifically directed at substance use disorders. And that would be the most effective way to encourage investment. And also by educating pharma that there's a potential for profitability. I've showed you that today. And also to think about the comparison, schizophrenia affects 1% of the population. Every major pharma that had a psychiatry program developed anti-schizophrenic drugs. By contrast, 1.2% of the population abuse stimulants other than cocaine. Tells you where the market should be and what the investment is. Much easier in terms of, uh, face, of, of face validity and construct validity, right, than the schizophrenia models. Okay? Now, what, the other thing that we can do, of course, is government funding, grants and contracts to, to academia and farm and biotech. That's my business. And... We, we certainly are doing that. We're running trials. We give grants to run trials. But the issue is, and the fundamental issue, and I want to leave you like this, with, the, with this thought, given the time and the cost to bring a compound to market, how much investment is, a, is appropriate for the government at this point in this area? And it, I, the, I don't know the answer, but I know that um, given that our budget is 12% of the NIDA budget, and 30% of this is mandated by Congress to go to AIDS research, that 9% of the NIDA budget is not enough to really develop drugs in a, in a, in a serious way. So I'm going to leave you with that thought, and i left 10 minutes or so to answer questions. Thank you. So that was a great talk. Thank you, Phil. As uh, he mentioned, we have 10 minutes for questions from the audience. Yes, Brian. Is markets not the patients, it's the providers. And narcotic treatment centers have a long history of using methadone, so they've warmed up to suboxone, they've been using clonidine, they've been using buprenorphine by itself. They're comfortable with it and they're using it. As soon as you move out of the narcotics clinic, you're into an absence-only 12-step model that's largely used at our treatment centers. That's correct. And um, so Revia, safe, used properly, it worked, and DuPont, couldn't sell it. And the rest of pharma saw that basically, although there's a lot of alcoholics, there's nobody willing to prescribe to the alcoholics. And so I think a, a major effort, I, I do at least a couple sessions a year for the area AHEC for local substance abuse providers. I'm the neurobiologist. 
they have to have a token neurobiologist for their workshops, um, try to educate them about the use of drugs and how it fits into the neurobiology of their patients. And, and we need a bigger effort to create a market by educating the providers. So let, let me make a comment. I, I, I completely agree with you. One of the things that, that was very distressing to me when I started working in this area is that the addictions field is probably the most balkanized uh, in any area of medicine, certainly in any area of psychiatry. So there's no area that, I mean, you have some fringe uh, psychiatrists that don't think that it's good to give drugs to schizophrenics, but it's a very, very, um, it's Bregan and those guys, I mean, they're, they're really sort of the lunatic fringe. Um, in the addictions community, there's a very large and vocal pe uh, uh, group that says don't substitute one addiction for another. Um, and that applies to maintenance, met met methadone maintenance. There's also an economic issue is that it's a methadone and substitution therapy is a cottage industry. Every time somebody comes in for that methadone, somebody gets reimbursed. And it's a great money maker, buprenorphine the same way. And the methadone guys really don't like the buprenorphine guys that much because they're taking away their business. So this is a very difficult area. The two things I think that are going to help are the passage, in, uh, recent passage of the, uh, the Mental he Health Parity Act, um, which puts addictions as part of mental health disorders on, on the same level as other types of addictions. And I'm hoping the Affordable Care Act actually may help as well in terms of being able to Reimbursed because some of the some of the issues which I didn't talk about where the drug companies would say, well, wait a minute, who's going to pay? And it turns out that that in fact, we people will pay. As if you look at that the data on uh, Suboxone, which is not inexpensive, a lot of that's private insurance because it works. So, I agree, it's a, it's a difficult area, and there has to be a lot of traction. The other thing is, if we had extremely effective drugs, I think people would 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 come out and use it, if you could demonstrate efficacy. Thanks. Another question from David McKinsey. I thought it was a really wonderful talk. And, and you know, having been in the industry for 14 years now, I, I fully echo your, your you know, uh, take on, on the pharmaceutical industry and the, the reticence to get in, involved with it. I've been arguing with, with our marketing folks for about the whole time I've been there. And, and, and you're totally right. It's a very low perceived market and there needs to be some strategies to, to change that outlook. I was actually very surprised how much Suboxone right. makes. I think that's a stat that I'd like to bring back to the company. I'll give you the slides, not a problem. Yeah, yeah. that would be yeah. very helpful. Um, so, so one question, the only uh, sort of ground that, that I've been able to make in terms of marketing, in terms of substance abuse, is, is that as a comorbidity with you know, schizophrenia, depression, other sort of mainstream psychiatric disorders. My, my, my issue with that is oftentimes is the clinical design of a study for that. You know, we tend to, if we go into schizophrenia, depression, you want a, you know, a relatively clean population. So those patients that have the comorbid substance abuse with the, the main uh, disease often are excluded. And, and the way they often kind of try to press that, and this is also, I think, from the FDA somewhat to get a dual diagnosis, is they want you to do a clean substance abuse population study and a clean, say, schizophrenia or depression study. It, but to me, that doesn't necessarily make sense. There may be different types of um, patients in that. Uh, do you have any, any words of wisdom to kind of help? To do to go into the right patients, actually, that these messy patients that have this right. dual diagnosis. So there, there's there's no such thing, as far as I've seen, as a clean uh, drug abuse patient, and I think that as clean addic addiction patient, they usually get other sort of comorbid conditions. Uh, so that would be a, a rare bird. So we generally, I mean, our exclusion criteria are pretty loose. But the the nice thing about doing these substance use disorder trials. You know, and coming from the depression area, it, I mean, it, it's really a, a great thing, is that when you screen your patients, you look for the presence of drug in the urine. And so if they show up, you know, uh, twice in a week with positive methamphetamine, it's pretty certain that they're using methamphetamine. Um, and so it's easy to get those types of patients, and then you sort of eliminate, so generally we, we eliminate schiz, we, we uh, uh, don't want schizophrenics in the trial. But um, it's very easy to, to get people that are, to, to, to really get a, quote, pure population of drug abusers. Um, but the dual diagnosis, 
I really don't have any, I, I wish I had some words of wisdom, but I'm, you know, my job right now is getting drugs approved to treat substance use disorders. So, yeah. Thank you. Any, other, any further questions? I actually have one of my own. Um, as we discussed earlier on, there are many students here at IBNS, um, and it's a, it's been a great society for them. Um, you mentioned about reading through some of the clinical trials, uh, for example, the modafinil trial that, you know, is that a failed trial or is it a failed drug? Um, any, would you like to expand on the words of wisdom for uh, when trying to read those trials, when trying to recreate studies or validating your model, uh, where some people would say it's not valid if modafinil worked if for methamphetamine? Right. Um, I, I think that Reading a report in the literature, and you see sometimes some spectacular reports in the literature on the effect of a drug, and I think it's it's not only true for uh, substance use disorders, it's generally true for other types of psychiatric conditions. Um, if the drug is approved for the condition, um, then I would say that it's been then then that that drug or that mechanism has been validated for that disorder. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Valium is approved for uh, use in anxiety disorders. Um, you can use that in your animal models as a positive control. If it works, that model probably has some predictive validity. I'm not talking about face validity. I'm not talking about construct validity. As pharmacologists, you're primarily interested in, in predictive validity. And I think those are really um, issues which as students and it's, even mature scientists, you, a, sometimes those issues are conflated. And they really need to be very, very separate that you can have. Um, and even very sophisticated people say, oh, yeah, you read these papers. You know, it's a test for depression. Um, it's not a test for depression. I mean, and we're talking about the, the Porcel test, uh, tail suspension test. They're not tests. They're not depression. It's not depression. That's, it's not even bad anthropomorphizing. But what they are, they're very good tests to predict whether or not Compounds are going to have antidepressant activity, and so those kinds of things. So when you read papers in the literature, I, you know, if that modafinil report, I would say because we, I made them include that compliance data in the modafinil report. So you say, you know, we don't know whether or not the the drug worked, but uh, for students, if the drug is approved for the indication, I'd say that the mechanism is valid. After that, I wouldn't, I would wouldn't put too much stock in clinical data. Sorry. <laughs>